I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm speaking to botanical storyteller Amanda Edmiston. Amanda trained in herbalism and has an encyclopedic knowledge of historical plants and botanical figures. But in this episode, we focus mainly on what Amanda does and her work around Elizabeth Blackwell's book, A Curious Herbal. So I thought we'd start, if we can, with you just talking a little bit about, well, what you do and why you chose to do it. So I started storytelling about 10 years ago now. I'd been studying herbal medicine at uh, university level and um, I'd had my daughter, my eldest, and I needed to find a kind of way of earning a living, but that actually was creative and fitted in around looking after a small child. And I didn't really feel drawn to going into clinical practice. So I was basically sort of footering around being a mum with a two-year-old and we had a lovely toddler group um, in a hidden garden in Glasgow and their remit was to work in the sort of most diverse cultural community in Glasgow so there were people from I think at one point 13 different countries um, parents and grandparents and their and their and small children and they started to ask the parents to do voluntary sessions, start finding a way to kind of connect quite disparate communities with really varied backgrounds, but using this beautiful garden space. There was a small birch wood, there were uh, laid out herb gardens in raised beds, there were beautiful wildflower meadows, structured areas with sculpture in them, and a big lawn, all in a really small area, but... Um, huge range of plants and uh, very safe in a walled area so that, you know, small children could play. Um, so I I decided, well, my mum had been a storyteller for around 20 years at this point, and um, I'd really always connected with stories. My family sort of have mostly have a background in some form of um, art or writing or sort of creative process. My my maternal grandfather was a sculptor and he always told me stories about the landscape or about why he'd made a sculpture or the history behind the figure he was portraying and I had kind of really I almost thought in stories from a very early age um my mum my mum's mum was a keen gardener her family were all involved in plants in some way uh her her father had been a a english romany and his mother had um had a had a really tough time of it from what we can gather from kind of fairly um minimal family records but he had actually decided to work until he could buy himself a farm and become a fruit farmer um so my mum had huge brilliant vivid memories of being taken to her grandfather my great-grandfather's fruit farm when she was little and climbing cherry trees and all this sort of thing and their children by my great aunts and uncles were an awful lot of them were involved in something to do with uh, plants so one became a market gardener one was green grocer they really connected with plants so when I decided when I needed to find something to do um, that was a paid, paid way of earning a living um, with a small child uh, as a single parent, and I was working in this beautiful hidden garden, it, and I was asked to do voluntary sessions, storytelling and sort of sharing folklore and uses of plants, whether it's traditional herbal use or cooking, felt like a very natural option. And people really, really enjoyed it. Um, I found that the very diverse range of countries that the parents came from, the plants were something that connected them all. So if you, you know, you could mention uh, cinnamon and that 
incredible sort of aroma is is so uh, evocative for just everyone from many different parts of the world and became a common bond because they could talk about cakes they remembered from childhood or um, walking in a wood and the smell reminding them of bark or, you know, uh, despite having really different backgrounds, plants would bring people together and they would enjoy sharing uses. The garden then got a small amount of funding and uh, paid me to do a run of sessions, a, a sort of small residency, if you like. And then I was asked to partner up that res- that residency with the Hidden Gardens in Glasgow with Chelsea Physic Garden in London and tie in spice stories that I had collected from mainly the Indian and Pakistani women in the toddler group and then tying them in, tying those stories and finding connections with Scottish stories. Uh, I was asked to go down and do spice stories for Chelsea Physic Garden um, for a spice weekend. Um, when I got back, the Scottish Ballet had caught up on my work. They worked in a nearby building and someone had seen some of my stuff. And they asked me to do a small video for their or film for their education department and write a version of Sleeping Beauty for them. And that kind of gave me the start, if you like, to think this is something I could do. This really connects people. People really love it and it resonates with them. And this is what I do with my knowledge of plants is I take that incredible sort of visceral love I have of plants that is kind of channeled through stories and folklore, but tied into tastes and smells and the feel of plants, if you like. And then I share that back out to people and engage them with that. And and it just took off from there. (laughs) Oh, Long story to a short result, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounds brilliant. But when you were talking, it made me wonder: is it universal, or do you find that some people have more childhood memories, for example, of plants? I'm just thinking: if you came from a really urban background, would you have as many resources to draw on? And I'm thinking also of that book. I think it's called The Lost Words, isn't it? Where mm-hmm. you know a lot of children don't have that nature vocabulary. Have you found that, or is there always something that you can tap into? Oh. I think that the lost words, I I have a copy, it's absolutely stunning and I've taken it out uh, to work with care homes um, when I've been doing reminiscence work with care homes sharing plant stories. I think that, yes, I mean, it's based on on an actual fact. I think there are children that are growing up with incredibly... um, urban lifestyles that have forgotten this but my experience and I have told in that in schools in very urban areas in areas sometimes with quite high levels of um of deprivation and I usually can find a way to engage them I think that there is something about the stories and as a professional storyteller you respond very much to the audience so I know um, I have a way of walking around where I'm about to work and part of that part of the process I go through when I'm walking is looking to see what plants there are and how the plant life copes with the surroundings so um, you start to pick up on you start to spot a dandelion that despite its concrete surrounds you know that taproot can go deep down into the earth and you um you know you connect with the plants that are there and then people know that the storytelling is about their space it's not alienating them it's not some space that they don't have any access to you connect it into their space and that uh, that like the dandelion root opening up a crack in the ground is a bit like the opening into this world of plants. I mean, I also have some great stories that I, I know that there are specific groups that, um, you know, there, there are age groups like uh, upper primary, early secondary find it hard to give up the cool, if you like, you know, they, they don't like to, they don't really like to fess up to, they just want to sit under a tree and fiddle around with a bit of grass anymore that you may you might get 
five and six year olds making daisy chains and blowing da- dandelion clocks. Your average 13 year old uh, in a city child probably would like doing that, but they're reluctant to admit to it in front of their peer group sometimes, not always. But I have stories about great, scary things, uh, you know, horrendous stories of of accidental poisonings or uh, always go down well or creepy stories where people are um oh they're almost superhero like in their structure um but they're actually really ancient traditional stories that involve outwitting the devil or um and and connecting in with the plant law at which point even the most reluctant hip teenager is usually usually with you <laughs> by the end you know i take i i mean i have a I have a session that I've been introducing people that maybe do feel a bit alienated by um, based on the true story of the con- of the confectioner that accidentally poisoned everyone with a mint humbug. Um, and I offer them all a humbug before I tell them about the poisoning <laughs> with the humbug, <laughs> regardless of age. <laughs> Adults and children all totally love that. And, and they all love the fact they might have accidentally been poisoned by a minty sweetie. You know, you've got a pot of mint in there with that. They then, it opens up, it opens up their interest. And so I think that Yes, there is a there is a risk that the knowledge isn't there so much anymore. Um, even working with rural schools, because quite a lot of our rural areas are for it's a very gross generalisation, but are, a lot more people are commuting from rural areas now. That maybe the uh, entrenched knowledge that's handed down from generations is not there so much. But if you tell people about it and you tell them a really good story about it and you let them taste and try and there's a bit of risk and excitement involved in that then the connection is very much still there um I think Mm. it's I think it's ingrained in us actually I think I think that you just need to open up the potential that's that's already there (laughs) yeah Brilliant. Um, well, I was wanted to talk a little bit about um, your work with Elizabeth Blackwell's book, mm-hmm. The Curious Herbal. Yeah. Um, that does get bandied about a little bit on Twitter. There's, there are a lot of people who are interested in horticulture that love that book. So why did you choose it? And um, can you maybe pick one of your favourite plants to, to talk about from the book? Sure. Um, I Well, I was asked to uh, create a, a bespoke workshop for the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Glasgow and they wanted a, an afternoon full day workshop um, looking at their history but building on my plant stories um, along a sort of we, we I developed a big timeline full of stories for them but I got to research in their library and they have some incredible books in there. I mean, they've got an original copy, copy of Audubon's Book of Birds, which if anyone's ever encountered it, um, it's, an, it's a huge, beautifully painted book of birds. They also have an incredible collection of herbals, which some of them date back to the uh, college's early days. It was founded by a sort of a, a three men one was an apothecary one was a a surgeon one was a a a physician and um so in amongst these herbals I came across Elizabeth Blackwell's A Curious Herbal the original 1737 edition and in many ways it was um it could have been overlooked because it's not as uh gaudy or as a lot of the a lot of the herbals maybe that are slightly later or as um peculiar if you like as some of the earlier ones you know the hortus which is 16th century often gets waved around with its anatomically correct pictures of tiny man-shaped mandrake roots you know uh waiting to be foisted from the ground and, and kill the assailant off um Elizabeth Blackwell's drawings are quite pared down, but they are incredibly accurate. Um, When I say pared down, the detail of the individual plants is very much still there. And it's one of the first books that you can accurately, you could have 
it's a bit big for a field guide, but you could have taken it out. And if you didn't know a plant, you could correctly identify it using Blackwell's books, which is quite a rare thing for the early 18th century. It also has the illustrations of the key part. So um, there's an awful lot of text in a lot of earlier herbals. And that's great. But there is something really accessible about those beautiful, accurate pictures that you could use. Now, I, I then found out she was from Aberdeen, the same place I'm from, and that she had uh, start, she decided to create her herbal when she was on her own with her young son, um, as I had been with my eldest daughter before I met my my husband. Um, and she had had to find a way to earn a living to support herself and her child. Her husband had squandered her dowry, her money. Um, we didn't have we didn't have the thing in Scotland where your husband owns your belongings. That was very much an English law. Um, <laughs> so even though they'd run off to London because he'd been his uh, medical credentials had been questioned, it would still have been Elizabeth's money. Her father was a wealth, wealthy stocking merchant and um, she, she set him up in a printing business. He then got into trouble. Uh, he didn't have the appropriate apprenticeship and he's thrown in Highgate Debtors Jail. She then had to find a way to support herself and her child. And instead of doing what many of us would be you know, forgiven for doing, which is turning around, going back to her mum and dad's, she actually started walking the gardens at Chelsea Physic Garden. Um, she put to Sir Hans Sloan, who owned the garden, and uh, Philip Rand, the the garden director it Hans Sloan was renting it out basically uh to the as his estate still does to the Royal Society of Apothecaries and she put to them that she was going to create a herbal with lifelike illustrations of plants now it was this incredible story because Sir Hans Sloan was uh, an eminent plant collector his collection is one of the things that started the Natural History Museum as well as uh, Chelsea Physic Garden he had been employed as a doctor out in the Americas, uh, albeit in a fairly trying and difficult period of history. You know, at this point, Glasgow's wealth was built on the sugar barons. Our relationship with the West Indies was, you know, built on, on slavery and abuse. But at the same point, Sir Hans Sloan was out there as a doctor and he clearly spoke to um, a great range of people because he brings back recipes for things like chocolate, which um, are not, you know, the, the this is um, this is a, a, a di you know, this is a different culture. This is not um, a white elite um, passing on these recipes. He does bring back Spanish recipes for using tomatoes. And she, Elizabeth Blackwell, having never been, starts drawing these plants. She not only draws the nettles and dandelions that she would have seen from her childhood in Scotland and no doubt covering London in those days, she sees these plants, some of them grown in the UK for the very first time, chocolate and tomatoes, which, you know, people, <laughs> I'm no longer surprised by the fact that nobody eats tomatoes in the 18th century. <laughs> that was news <laughs> to me so long ago. I've forgotten that it still is new to, new to some people, but the British didn't eat tomatoes in the 18th century. In fact, we very much adhered to the Germanic Northern European myth that tomatoes were poisonous, being related to the, you know, being one of the Atropa families, so related to belladonna, um, uh, mandrake, uh, henbane. And she talks about tomatoes. She mentions that they're eaten in, in Italy, Spain, uh, with dressing like we do cucumbers. But at the same point, the mass feeling about tomatoes in the UK is this one of fear. It was believed that witches used tomatoes to turn their enemies into werewolves. She's just, you know, this is a, so this is a fantastic period of history that she's working in. Middle class women didn't work for a living. She's very middle class. She's doing this to survive and bring up her child. She gets accredited by these two huge male establishment bodies, you know, the Royal College of Physicians and the 
Royal Society of Apothecaries. She does the whole thing to support her child and she's drawing plants that have never before been seen in Britain but in a way that could be identified by anyone walking along the street. So she's taking that bit of information that maybe only these very elite people might have seen and sharing it in a book. Now, there's also a twist because she creates her book episodically to, you know, reporters always say she does this so to give herself a steady income. And I don't doubt that for a minute. But whether knowingly or not, she also makes it accessible because she keeps the price down because she does one a week. So you could have bought it like a, a newspaper or a magazine. So at the point that medicine is being taken from being, you know, a very much a, it's a few hundred years where this is going on. This is a, you know, constantly changing situation. But medicine is more and more, this is the end of the witch hunts. So, uh, you know, she's born about the same time the last witch in Aberdeen is is uh, put, put to trial. Witchcraft is not entirely revoked until just before her book comes out. So she'll be in her nearly 30 by that point um, or in her 30s. And this is a different time, you know, so information is being taken out of the hands of the common people and being... Um, turned into a more structured form of medicine that requires um, more qualifications, more sort of um, assessment by an establishment. This is not necessarily a bad thing, but uh, the shift in information is fascinating. So as soon as I twigged that she, her book was published in 1737, so the end of the witch trials, in a time that um, Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, so a, end of 60, 70 years later is described by um, a vicar as uh, um, encouraging women into the uh, unhealthy area of botany, that he thinks it's incredibly unseemly for women to be engaging in botany. And he thinks there's nothing more abhorrent than the thought of boys and girls botanizing together. Uh, but, you know, this is 60 years after Blackwell has published a herbal that has been accepted by the medical establishment. So, you know, she's doing something much more risky, much more risque than um, than than we often give her credit for. And then there was a huge period of time in the 60s, you know, really quite well respected um, commentators on botanical illustration sort of write her work off as you know nice flower drawings not very exciting um but the the point is that they don't need to be exciting what they are is accurate and they're sharing information there's another great myth as well and I as soon as I saw the book and I had this really deep personal connection to her and I felt, kind of felt this is a, a a woman whose paths I keep crossing you know whether it was in Chelsea Physic Garden where we'd both started off our professional careers, or whether it was um, out, you know, place where we were born, then um, it's, you know, there was something really compelling about that. But I also immediately thought, hang on a minute, this is, you know, she's been overlooked and written off as I'm, uh, as as you know, just as as not having the value if you look at what she does in the correct period of time, there's this other thing, yeah, this is where I was heading with that, that she, um, for years, everyone has said, uh, she took the book in and her husband wrote the words from his prison cell, which I have very little evidence about this. <laughs> <laughs> other than anyone I've said it to, including the staff and, you know, the um, people down at Chelsea Physic Garden, that I've said, now, no one's put this out there yet, but I'm going to say this now. I do not think for a minute that she, you know, went across the Highgate from Chelsea to get her husband to write the words in prison when she was spending every single day drawing and talking to apothecaries and doctors in Chelsea Physic Garden who had an extensive library and all the books that she quotes from, Gerard and Culpepper and people like that. She collect, 
gets plant samples from the University of Leiden, which was the leading medical hospital at the time. Um, my friend Elizabeth Brooks, the herbalist and author has also said she we've had a conversation she has some evidence that Elizabeth Blackwell probably studied midwifery at, um, with workshops with um, William Smiley and certainly she talks about midwifery herbs in a way that doesn't doesn't sound like someone who didn't know she's not getting someone else to write those words I think that that myth grew up in order to make to, for them to be able to sell the book, the publishing rights to the book later on, which they did. Mm. And uh, she does that um, when she's about to go and join her husband out in Sweden. Um, that goes horribly wrong. That's another of his bad <laughs> ideas. Because, uh, as you probably know, he ends up executed for um, and is implicated in a plot uh, that puts him, that they think he was part of the Jacobite rebellion and is implicated in a plot to overthrow the Swedish throne or change the lineage of the, the Swedish throne. Um, and she doesn't ever go to Sweden and we kind of lose track of her there. So um, the the book I'm, I've been working on for, for a little while now Um Although it's not entirely a biography of Blackwell, it um it's more about the plants and the stories, like you know the wolf, the um the werewolf story with the tomatoes. Those all thread into it. But one of the things I do is link the plant stories up to, and maybe what happens to her after we lose track of her. Uh, we do know she's buried at Chelsea Old Parish Church and next to Sir Hans and Lady Sloane. And I mean, there are so many little nuances and different narratives into the plant world um, that, that flow through my my project, The Very Curious Herbal, um, that, it, I, you know, we'd be here for months, um, yeah. you know, because coffee is just coming to the country, chocolate's just coming to the country, and we've got all those incredible um, spices from uh, India and so things like uh, uh, tamarind, which is African, and, and uh, turmeric, and and yeah, it's a, as alongside nettles and dandelions. So, it, I, I mean, I just had this encounter with a book, found out her story, um, fell a bit in love, and had to keep. Uh, I, I keep uncovering new connections every every chapter I write. <laughs> yeah, I bet you do. Actually, out of interest, when you were talking about it, um, I wondered, do you know what came first? Was it the idea that tomatoes turn people into werewolves or was, the, was it the name lycopene? Does one, does one precede the other? Uh, I think the werewolf thing um, precedes the lycopene because there is an interesting row goes on pretty much um whilst Elizabeth is um is working uh she just uh, just about predates uh, Linnaeus so uh, Linnaeus um but where some one sort of faction is calling it the love apple um so it's uh, Pomodorus oh, I can't think what its second name is and I should know oh, it might be Pomodorus selenium um and then and she refers to it as a love apple in her book but the um lycopodium persicum um is the um other option that was argued over the wolf peach uh, uh, latin for the wolf peach and that probably is connected into that werewolf legend and the uh, lycopene then comes from that and uh, you know in the in the in my storytelling in the sessions the very curious herbal sessions and in the the manuscripts that is hopefully becoming a book um the i do explore that name the wolf peach as a my herbalist the herbalist in me wants to connect that to what we describe as an inflammatory cascade many people realize that some things the that family this the solenae i can never say that word solenaeum solenium family um can be quite inflammatory so potatoes aubergines tomatoes and um the inflammation can aggravate things like sometimes like eczema or digestive disturbance but also things like pmt 
And for me, there's a there's a real light bulb moment where I go, ooh, inflammation and werewolves. <laughs> because, you know, anything that inflames you um, in an energetic medicine, we often see as having that potential to make people hot and angry. And whether that's hot, angry skin or hot, angry temper, um, mm. I wonder if there's a, there's a little, there's a little connection there that, that from my point of view is quite intriguing and that's what I do with a lot of my work my work that's why I describe myself as a herbal storyteller and where the name Botanica Fabula came from because any story I tell I try and extract how that story relates the how we use the plants whether it's in food medicine even simple games sometimes or or, or sayings things like that um or social history that I, I try and tell stories that there is a aspect of, of truth hidden in them. And I think that's possibly one of the reasons, back to what you were saying earlier, that people find it easy to connect because it, it lifts it out from being just a fairy story. There's like a, a hidden fact and people like following that through. And, you know, even very young children will turn around to me and say that, story is teaching me something that you know I've learned the science hidden there in there somewhere you know um it uh it's it, people immediately um recognize it as a way we might have been taught things in pre-literate times and handed on information so I think that's kind of um where my notion of herbal storytelling threads through everything I do really thanks to Amanda for taking part in the podcast do go and check out her website She's telling stories from the Very Curious Herbal Project at the Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh in October as part of the Scottish International Storytelling Festival. And she does travel throughout the UK and internationally for work. So get in touch if you'd like to book her for an event as well. I actually interviewed Amanda a while back and for reasons to do with getting a good balance of topics, I've waited until now to release the episode and I think the timing is perfect. I've been listening to people who have struggled with returning to work or with returning to the office, with a return to the norm, and sometimes even with leaving the house since the lockdown has been lifted. Amanda's story is interesting because she chose a job that worked for her, that fit around her circumstances and that allowed her to follow her passion. And it's a job that some may be surprised to find even exists, and that's the beauty of horticulture. There are so many overlaps with other fields and so many jobs that can be done that involve it. I think many of us have tasted a different life since the beginning of the year and I hope some of you have decided that actually the old grind isn't what you want. I also know many people and I include myself among them who've stepped off the roundabout and followed a different path. It isn't always easy, it isn't always comfortable but it does give you the freedom to live in a way so far removed from the conventional that you'll wonder how you ever did it and you'll know that you'll never go back. To round off the episode, I'll leave you with Dr. Ian Bedford talking about a nightmarish insect that could probably feature in one of Amanda's stories. It's strange to think that a fly would intentionally cause a mid-air collision with a bee or a wasp, but that's exactly what the female canopid flies do. Canopids are commonly known as thick-headed flies and have evolved to look remarkably like small stripy wasps. But, unlike wasps, they only have one pair of wings. You can often see canopids on flowers where they're innocently feeding on nectar. However, there's a dark side to a canopid's life since they are deadly parasites of bees and wasps. The mid-air collision that the female canopids cause is actually a carefully coordinated process for them to insert an egg into the chosen victim. Remarkably, their egg-laying organ is like a can opener which in a microsecond prizes open a soft area of the victim's body and deposits an egg inside. In a flash the deed is done and the canopid has gone. The unfortunate victim will continue to go about its business whilst within its body the canopid's egg hatches into a tiny maggot. The maggot begins feeding on the victim's internal organs and rapidly grows, eventually pupating within the now empty body cavity where in a few days time 
a fresh new adult canopid fly will emerge. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.